What's up, guys? Welcome back to Storytime with Local Reddit. My name is John, and this is r slash Tales from Tech Support. So, take two, speaking of technical difficulties. <laughs> so, I recorded this video once already, and uh, yeah, come to find out that I had some problems with my sound software crashing earlier, and when I got it all back up and running, lo and behold, I didn't set the correct microphone for the recording, and it recorded through the camera microphone. So it sounded like I was sitting on the other side of the room recording and uh, I thought about letting it go, but then, you know, nah, I just, I couldn't do it. So we're going to re-record and uh, hope for the best. The Dumb Terminal and the Dumber. This is from way back when I was in my early 20s in the early 2000s. I worked in a factory and did IT. It wasn't a big enough place for a full-time tech at first, so I also worked a printing press on day shifts. This was just before we had a PC on every desk, so there were a few that did specific jobs, ink mixer, barcode printer, etc., and a system of dumb terminals that were serial daisy chained back to a 386 to run a production management system. These things were pretty bulletproof from year to year, but the guys on the shop floor weren't the gentlest, so sometimes an RS-232 cable would need replacing or resoldering if it got knocked. Easy, but a pain. One morning, one of the warehouse lads said there was a problem with one of the terminals not working. So I went to have a look, expecting either to have to wriggle a lead or possibly replace a cable. This thing was smashed to absolute bits. Even the old, inch-thick CRT glass was cracked. The housing was in multiple pieces and there was circuit board hanging out. The warehouse team honestly seemed to think I would be able to fix this easily and quickly, and seemed keen to get it done before the main day shifts came in, so I probed into exactly what had happened. Someone on the night shift had dropped a ton roll of paper off a forklift onto the other side of the desk to the terminal, siege engineing it 40 feet across the shop floor. I was not able to fix it. I don't understand why anybody, any company, any person, anything, would have a computer in a spot where forklifts were crossing by with heavy stuff, or forklifts crossing by even with nothing on them. It doesn't make any sense to me. Foundry workers, they don't put their production PCs, you know, right up near the... Uh, furnace thingy you know what i mean the thing that melts all the metals and you know makes it all molten <laughs> words are hard of serial terminals and baud rates yeah i know i'm gonna have some people tell me it's bald some people tell me it's bowed anyway i say bald inspired by the other dumb terminal story i was reminded of this in my pre-tech support career but i was still a nerdy kid and knew more than the powers that be as a teenager, I worked for a credit reporting agency that used a single 386 Unix server for about 15 users. In practice, it worked pretty well. They had 115.2k serial connections to each terminal, so it didn't feel too slow or anything. What happened, however, was our particular branch started to run out of work to do. We did mortgage reporting, so our volume was randomly up and down based on interest rates. So our regional management had the brilliant idea to have us work jobs from the office 500 miles away. Their solution, and I'm fairly certain it wasn't voted on by corporate IT, was to have a few of the terminals each have their own 2400 baud modem to dial into the remote Unix system. It was seamless at 115.2k, but was an absolute slog at 2400. At the time, I ran a BBS, so I was pretty familiar with dial-up tech, and I requested they switch to 14.4k modems. I don't think 288 was a thing yet. And they refused, even though the relatively high cost of a modem in 1992 or 93 was a factor. The fact that our work slowed down to the point where everything we did was four to five times slower, hence costing them way more money than the modems would, was quickly dismissed. Oh my gosh, side rant. Anyway, I remember the year before I was married, I bought from a friend, and I use that term loosely, a Windows 95 computer for about a hundred bucks. And I don't know if that was a good price at the time because I knew nothing about computers at all. It came with a monitor and some speakers, yada, yada, which was ironic because this computer didn't have a sound card. It didn't have a CD-ROM drive and it did not have a modem. So basically we had a computer with a monitor and a cheapy printer and that was about it. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I swung a hammer all day for a living. How many letters am I going to type here? So we thought, okay, let's make it useful so that the kids can learn. And I also get bored, by the way. So I was going to take this thing apart one way or the other to see what made it tick. So within a week of buying this thing, I had it apart on the kitchen table. Found out where to order parts from, and I ordered a, uh, a sound card. I ordered the CD-ROM drive. I don't remember what speed or anything, but that doesn't matter. And uh, then I ordered a 14.4 modem. Thought I was hot stuff, man. I mean, I did pretty good not knowing anything about anything. And uh, yeah, 
I had it all installed, got us up and running. And until I was ready to pay for monthly internet service, I think I was scrounging up AOL CDs at the time. Sounds familiar. I know I did that for months one way or the other. Uh, you know, sometimes times were tough, so we did what we had to do, and i just keep signing up for new uh, promotional things, you know. And then within about a month, I got tired of the 14.4 speeds and bought me a 28.8 from another friend. I say friend loosely because they really weren't my friends. They were uh, kind of shady, and I haven't talked to them in probably 25 plus years. So there's that. Anyway, side ramble over. Lithium battery. So a few background facts. I'm an engineering student. I worked at a large Scandinavian electronics store as an in-person external support person for customs or customers. I don't know. We are not trained or required to know IT stuff. So only stuff like installing screen protectors, office packages, and the usual old people support. We have Google and general knowledge and know-how. We are in the EU, so GDPR applies to us. So on to the story. There was this old man. Think mobility scooter, spicy water skin type, and oxygen tubes. He comes in every once in a while, really rude, and didn't understand that, no sir, I'm not allowed to fix your government identification, and no, I don't know what your password is. This goes on for a year or so. One day he comes in and drives up to me. I need a charger for this. Me. Okay, sir, let me take a look. I look, and it's a no-brand forehead lamp that we don't sell. Sir, we don't sell this product. Him. Yeah, but there's this port on it. You must know what charger I need. I look at the port, which is a small round hole in an arbitrary size, not a barrel plug or jack size. I see there's a clip, which I open to find two lithium batteries. I say to the man that, sir, I don't know what charger you need, and we don't have the batteries. Him. Can't you just sell me a charger that'll work? Contemplating the level of care I have, and I came to the conclusion that explaining to him lithium battery and dangers of charging them with random voltages was more than I get paid for, but selling him a random charger is fine. Sir, you have to go to the store you bought it from. Him. Huh. And then he drives off to my colleague who sells him a universal charger. I used plenty of universal chargers back in the day. Uh, some of them were even random voltages and everything else. As long as they were within a couple of points, I, uh, I used them. Sometimes you had to do what you had to do, and the local RCA only had so many plugs and chargers, and they were known for having everything, basically, so if you couldn't find it there, you weren't going to find it pretty much anywhere. But honestly, if this guy was as rude as you say, then uh, screw him. Grab it with your hands. My memory's been inspired by some recent posts. There's me, and then there's user. So user calls up from one of our more prestigious, read Bastard Evil Property Management Company, clients. She's around my age, 25 to 27, and we've been working together for about five years. In these five years, I've done my absolute best to get her to understand some basics of how computers work. This is mostly because my company's tiny, and as such, I wear all hats. So mitigating some of the petty bollocks goes a fair way to making my day easier. At times, she seemed to be making progress. At other times, it seems she was actively spiting me. So anyway, she calls up, issue with her internet. Some workmen had come in, unplugged her ethernet cable, and plugged it back into the wrong wall port. Normally this is no biggie, right? Right? So I tell her, find the internet cable coming from the back of your PC, and it's probably blue, and trace that back to the wall and tell me what number's above the port it's plugged into. I know for a fact that she knows what all of this means. User, sorry, what? I can't find it. You said a blue cable? Me. That's okay, it might not be blue. Could be gray, but either way, you know where it plugs in, right? In the back of your PC? User. Yeah, I think I know the one, I just can't find it anywhere. Me. Hmm. Maybe you removed it for some reason. That's fine though, go grab another spare cable from the drawer, plug it into your PC, and then plug it into the port labeled 19 on the wall. User. Okay, I've got the cable, but I can't find where to plug it in. Me, getting frustrated because I know she knows where this goes. It's about midway down in the back of the PC. Come on, user, you moved and plugged in three PCs the other day. User, yeah, I just can't find it. Me, the cable goes into the only hole that it'll fit. It's literally a square goes into the square hole thing. User, it's not here. Me, now with my head in my hands, uh, okay, let me send you a picture. So I send her a picture of the back of a PC with the Ethernet port highlighted. User, yep, it's not here. Okay, how about you send me a picture of the back of the PC? User, okay, how do I do that? I can't get behind it. Me. Just pull it forward. User. I don't know what you mean. Grab it with your hands and physically pull it towards you. This is actually what I said. User. Okay, okay, I'll send you a picture in a moment. Five minutes goes by and I get my picture. I open my emails, happy to be close to getting this nonsense sorted. 
oh, the nonsense had just begun. Because you know what I was greeted with? An image of a DVI, VGA, and HDMI port, and the bank logo. She'd been talking about her effing screen. I call back. User, that's your screen. Your PC is the big box that you turn on every day. You know, much like the ones that you moved around the office the other day, and then plugged back in and turned on. Oh, I thought that was the hard drive. Me, now shouting, yeah, it's got one in it. Anyway, if you're curious, I was right. Guy plugged it back into the wrong wall port. I've kind of resigned myself to the fact that most users aren't going to know the difference between their monitor and their PC. It's just one of life's mysteries. It is what it is. It's not even worth getting upset over anymore. But if you've been telling this lady computer stuff for the last five years, and she recently moved three computers by herself, unplugged everything and plugged everything back in, then uh, there's just no excuse that I can think of that's reasonable. Although the thought did cross my mind. Maybe she's sweet on you. Maybe she just decided to keep stringing you along on the phone call because she likes talking to you. I don't know. It's not sane, but what do you guys think? Do you think this lady was just that dumb and oblivious? Or do you think there was like an ulterior motive to her call? Let me know down below. Customer got the laptop, but not the password. Disclaimer. I do not work in the IT field, but I do work in the computer lab of my local library. And I'm a tech enthusiast, so I provide tech support on a regular basis. I had a man who came in with a Windows laptop. He got the laptop when his brother died, but never got the password. He wanted access to the laptop in case it had sentimental files on it, i.e. photos. I was bored and I had enough knowledge to know that it could be done, so I took the challenge. I would like to note that I'm currently taking some basic IT courses through a local college, but I've done it for less than a year at this point and my knowledge of computers and general IT stuff is still limited. Step one, can we reset password through the normal means? There is a reset password button on the login screen, but nope. We needed access to the email address tied to the person's Microsoft account to go through that process and we didn't have that. Step two, go to Google and do some research. I found multiple utilities to change the password on Windows devices. I downloaded Hiren's boot disk and tried to change the password, but unfortunately it didn't work for the account I wanted to access. However, I was able to unlock an admin account on the computer, and using that I was able to view other files under different users. I couldn't find any photos, documents, or other files on the laptop. I also used a USB to boot into Linux, look at files on the Windows hard drive. Outside of default Windows data, System32 and things like that, it was empty. I tested this out on my computer and was able to access my personal files through Linux. So I can only assume that this method works on most computers for finding personal files without logging in through Windows. As such, I concluded that the laptop was completely empty of personal files. I gave it back to the man and showed him that it was empty, and he left happy that he has a usable laptop now. I learned a lot during this. I bought USB sticks and learned how to boot into Linux for this project. I now have Hiren's boot disk as a just-in-case sort of thing, and one happy customer. One of the proudest moments of my career thus far. Good for you, OP, for sticking with it and, you know, working through it, even though you didn't know what you were doing, and I probably wouldn't have either. I, I probably would have had to Google everything, but... I do remember having to recover a couple laptops for my kids and my wife at one point in time. Uh, yeah, passwords, man. I also remember going to night school, uh, taking computer science classes, and I sat next to this really sharp whiz kid who knew a lot about computers already and did some programming. And from what I remember, he was just taking the classes so that he could get his official degree and uh, his certs and all that stuff. So... Anyway, he's the one that introduced me to Linux to begin with, and he had me set up on a dual boot, plus we had a thumb drive that I could boot from into Linux. It was pretty cool being able to get into Linux and mess around. I, I didn't have much use for it, and I still don't to this day. It's just not something that you know I get myself wrapped up into, but it was pretty neat. I think that was Ubuntu at the time. Uh, but yeah, pretty neat stuff. The one about the wireless access point that uh, wasn't supposed to exist. To set the stage, this event took place about 20 years ago or so. T1 lines running at a blazing 1.5 megabits per second were still the corporate internet gold standard at the time, and my office building had two, count them, two T1 lines. We were living high on the hog. I was fairly low-level technician on the tech support and system administration team. We were, of course, charged with maintaining that network, among other things. Yes, that means I periodically ran Ethernet cables through the ceiling and could regularly be found asking people things much like, have you tried turning it off and on again? Before the IT crowd was even a thing. Some of the dialogue and such may be slightly off given the passage of time, but the general gist is accurate enough. 
Our characters for today's misadventure are going to be Dave, Alvin, and Simon. <laughs> I, as your narrator, was a mere bystander in this story and so of no consequence at all. Dave was the assistant manager on our team and generally considered to be pretty bright. On this day, Dave was chatting with one of our end users, Simon, in a conference room on the fifth floor. Simon said, hey Dave, I didn't know you guys had wireless at this location. Don't you think it ought to be locked down though? Dave was perplexed. What? We don't have any wireless access here. What on earth are you on about? Well, see for yourself. Simon showed Dave his laptop, connected to the internet via a wide open Wi-Fi access point. No access security of any kind. Now you may instinctively speculate that maybe it was just someone else's internet connection. Except that we were the sole tenant on the top seven floors of that eight floor building. Oh, and by the way, Simon just happened to be surfing our corporate intranet website. There's all kinds of private corporate stuff on there. You're not supposed to be able to see those websites unless you're either A, physically connected to our corporate intranet, or B, tunneling in via the corporate VPN. A quick showed that the VPN wasn't running, so... What the hell? Dave was no longer merely perplexed. He was hopping mad. He promptly went back to his office on the fourth floor and grabbed his own laptop. He opened up the wireless network connection tool and walked back to the elevators in the center of the building. While standing in the foyer on the fourth floor, he checked for Wi-Fi. Sure enough, there was the wireless access point on his screen, but not with the strongest of reception. He got in an elevator, went down to the second floor, and stepped out. The signal was weaker there. He then got back in the elevator and punched the button for the sixth floor. The signal got much stronger. Bingo! He started walking that floor as the signal meter fluctuated. Until he saw it. Sitting in plain sight at Alvin's desk was a cheap home Wi-Fi router happily blinking its lights and greeting. I'd like to tell you that Dave promptly yelled, Alvin! And that a shocked Alvin practically jumped out of his skin. But alas, while the assumed names herein might have made that piece of the story amusing, it would have been entirely fictional. Plus, Alvin wasn't even in the office at the time. What I can tell you instead is that Dave walked over to that wireless access point, summarily yoinked it from the desk, and took it back to his own office. Then he emailed Alvin to inform him as to the whereabouts of his property. When Alvin came around to collect it, he was quite conciliatory. The explanation he offered was that he was just trying to see if he could work from his laptop outside in the sun or some such thing. He didn't really think through the security aspects of an open access point. No, thankfully his wireless access point wasn't even remotely strong enough for that, even if it hadn't been abruptly yanked off the network. Needless to say, Alvin was very firmly chastised and told to never connect his wireless access point to the corporate network again. Much like his namesake, that was by no means the only misadventure that Alvin undertook. Though the rest of his antics will unfortunately have to remain in the forgotten echelons of the past. But it's honestly a wonder that he wasn't fired for some of the things he did. But so far as I know, he never tried that particular stunt again. And of course in the aftermath, Dave eventually ordered up some new sophisticated Cisco routers to upgrade our network. And naturally, port security was foremost on his mind. That's a new one for me. I don't think I've ever heard of anybody setting up their own wireless access point at their place of work. I mean, half the time I didn't even have my own equipment or a laptop to begin with. So I was kind of tethered to a computer, somebody else's desk, my own desk, whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, the guy sounds pretty smart for being able to set it up, except for the fact that he didn't think about anything security wise. I don't know how long ago you said this was, but I, you would think that the team would have been keeping an eye out for stuff like that. I mean, if you were worried about corporate espionage and, and files getting looked at and things like that. So, uh, I've had a few bosses in the past though, that they wouldn't have yoinked it off the desk right away. They probably would have went and found a hammer came in when Alvin was there and made a scene with the hammer smashing the wireless access point before they yoinked it off the desk. Nowadays that would get you landed in jail because yeah, you frightened somebody. That's a whole other story. Anyway, thanks for sharing a little bit of your day with me today, guys. This is the second recording of this video today. <laughs> I recorded an episode last night on my laptop trying to do a trial run for you guys uh, with sound only and no, and no camera shot, uh, just text and some pictures and things like that. And uh, what a disaster. So I'm having a little bit of a rough time with recordings here, but we're getting it done. So... Anyway, I'll, I got a loaner laptop that I can use while I'm away this weekend, and uh, we'll see how it goes. All right, guys. Till the next one, we'll see you.